Well, hang on. So, so Pep Guardiola is standing in front of you as you're about to take a throw in. Are you not? It's part of you not What's like, the, oh my god, yeah, that is Pep Guardiola. The I. <laughs> This is my opportunity to take Pep out and, and, and free the rest of the Premier League. <laughs> Make a story, yeah. Maybe Arsenal might be good after him. My guest today is a remarkable gent whose decade and a half-long career has been one of dedication, perseverance and tenacity. Taking him from the muddy pitches of Penny Cross Primary School, Plymouth, deep in England, southwest Big Toe, to a Premier League contract. By the time he was 17, he became a leader who's captain two teams to promotion, first leading Cheltenham Town from League Two to League One, and then as club captain of your mighty Wrexham, helping them break free from the National League for the first time since 2008. Since Taylor Swift was writing breakup songs about the third best Jonas brother, he's also become the player with the single most powerful, oh, possibly the single most feared throw in in the entire football pyramid. He's a human trebuchet, a man whose skills finally answer the question what have you combined a professional footballer with a t shirt cannon? It is a true joy to welcome Mr. Ben Tozer. Brilliant. Hello, Rog. What an introduction. Well, Ben, what a life you have lived. We are talking to you at a time when Wrexham sit in second place in League Two after a hard thought drew away at Harrogate Town, which followed a dominant 6-0 win over Morecambe, the most disappointing day for shrimp since Baltimore's Bubba Gump restaurant got shut down by the health department. And we are 20 games into the season. You actually have three games in three different competitions in like the next eight days. How are your mind and body, Ben, this far into the campaign? Are you feeling fresh and measured? Or does it feel like you're midway through a marathon? Bit of runner's nipple, miles run, miles to go. To be honest with you, I feel I feel fresh. It's uh, I had a little bit of a break out of the team. I feel really fresh. It's, uh, it's I'm surprised it's 20 games in, to be honest with you. But when you get to, usually when you get to January, start of February, um, that's when you start to really think, right, we're in the middle of a marathon here. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's it feels feels good at the moment. And like you say, we're on it. We're on a fairly good run. So yeah, we need to keep that keep that up. I think you'll be singing a different tune by the end of this interview. You'll be emotionally, mentally, yeah. and physically shattered. But I want to go back to the beginning of your career, a decade and a half before Welcome to Wrexham, before Marvel's costume designer started even measuring Ryan Reynolds for his Deadpool suit. Your professional career started 2007 season with then League One side Swindon Town. You made two appearances for the Robins. Um, and then January 2008, then Newcastle manager and eternal pie enthusiast Sam Allardyce signed you to a four and a half year contract Oh, at the tune. And I've seen th- photos of you back then, Ben. You were just 17 years yeah. old. You had a very nice leather jacket. You had an in-betweeners haircut. <laughs> you look like that picture is every young person's dream, but you made it real holding the home shirt of a Premier League team in your own paws, Ben. Can you tell us, what does a player feel like in that moment? Are you like, I'm 17 and my dream is coming true? I feel like when you're in the moment, you're a bit you're a bit less aware of what it really means. Uh, you kind of just think, right, this is my job. I've, it's an unbelievable opportunity. I am 17 years old, but I'm moving from one end of the country to the to the other, um, living on my own now. So, like, kind of let's just step up and, and go for it and give it everything we've got and, and enjoy it. And that's, that's the kind of approach that I took to it. And, um, yeah, I mean, no regrets, really. Is there a bit of – is it fearlessness of youth, that moment? that leather jacket or is there a tiny bit of fear in there too like how do you plug in the toaster again mum a bit a bit of that I suppose I mean I did have nights where I was ringing my stepdad or my mum my and asking uh what to cook cooking advice things like that and I couldn't even get a sky contract to watch tv and and things you know and literally I wasn't allowed to do it but again I think there was a, an element of real naivety with like you say the leather jacket the the dread, dreaded leather jacket. Nice. <laughs> but at the time, it's just, you don't care. You feel on top of the world. And honestly, it felt I felt like I was on top of the world. So for me to just revel in it and enjoy it, and don't get me wrong, I don't regret wearing the leather jacket. Could I have worn something different? Yeah, but at the same time, who cares? 
Oh, God bless. As long as the Xbox works, who needs food? But this is an amazing moment. Just 24 hours after you join the club. And to be candid, listeners, not because Ben Toza joined the club, but for other That's reasons, true. Sam Allardyce, the manager who'd scouted you, who, who'd ID'd you, who'd negotiated for you, who probably raised a pint of white wine uh, when he'd heard that you signed the contract. He was sacked. Um, as a brand new player who probably hadn't even finished unpacking yet, can you describe the emotions, the uncertainty that goes through your mind when you hear that? How do you hear? What do you feel? Especially at such a young age in your career. Um, I was, it was a bit, it was, it was very deflating actually because I'd been up before I'd signed, I'd been up and met the gaffer. Um, he'd spoken to me about what his plans were for me. Um, and then again, when I signed, they brought me in. He was like, right, this is your program. You've got a program. We're going to have you in the gym for one or two weeks um, with a, with your own fitness fitness instructor, um, sports scientist and, and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to get you like primed and ready. And then, yeah, the next day, sacked. And you think, wow. I mean, you got a bit of reassurance off the, uh, the CEO of the club who, who messaged my agent and said, you know, even if he'd have gone, well, uh, we we still would have signed Ben, and you think, well, you know, that's nice to hear. But at the same time, after all that, you're like, wow, this is, uh, yeah, this is real. So um, you kind of, like I say, a bit deflated. But at the same time, what an opportunity still to to try and take with with two hands. Yeah, you've got a future. You've got a role. You've got that leather jacket, probably the only thing I imagine, on a hanger in your closet. And you spent two years up there on Tyneside. You made two appearances for Newcastle. The club, unfortunately, relegated to the championship during your time there. But you had the opportunity to play alongside and to train with on the daily players like Manchester United's trophy hoarding midfielder, Nicky Butt, former Liverpool striker Michael Owen, and and the indomitable James Milner, who I think working the dates out was probably about 42 or 43 uh, back when you played with him. And he will undoubtedly be the only other survivor sharing a post-apocalyptic apartment with Arius Stark and Keith Richards when this world of ours goes kaput. But Ben, these are, these are experienced men of wonder who've seen it all. What did you learn from that Toon experience, your time alongside these veteran Premier League icons that you've carried with you throughout your own career? I think what it is, is the, the balance of training, uh, the, the mixture between having a laugh and then it's work time. That was kind of the one big thing that I really, really saw. They love to have a laugh behind the scenes every day in training, whether that's playing pool and, and things like, you know, um, taking, the, taking the mick out of each other as you do in the changing room. But when it came to work time, it was it was work time and it was serious and it was real serious. So, you know, like just getting that balance and, and that was the that was the main thing. And when, when you see James Milner, I always say to everyone, James Milner, people were slating him when he was playing for England. Um, you know, what what how is he playing for England? I'm like, this guy, he deserves everything he's ever earned in his career. Every penny, every appearance, every trophy. He deserves that he's the hardest working player I've ever seen in my career. So for me to see that and witness that firsthand, you think, wow. That's what it is. That's what that's what that's what that that is. You know, that's where the top is. God bless James Miller. Who was the best pool shark on that Newcastle squad? Who well, always take myself? Money? I always fancy myself. I kind of grew up in the around <laughs> pubs with my mum and dad drinking lots, and you know, I always I always fancy myself to be anyone. I back myself yeah. <laughs> on the pool table. Had three seasons as well. Just come. <laughs> I love you. Oh my god! You, so you could take Michael Owen. You could take out on the yeah, pool table. Yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's still fun for myself now. Yeah, that I would love to see. But from Newcastle, you moved to Northampton Town on a loan, which became permanent. September two thousand and ten. You and your cobbler's teammates pulled off one of the all-time great cup sets in the League Cup. Now the Carabao, then known as the Carling Cup. You're not Liverpool out of the competition, in a penalty shootout. Oh, Northampton's first ever win at Anfield, which prompted Liverpool's then manager, Roy Hodgson, to apologise, saying he was, quote, deceived, and he thought his side, quote, would do better. 
Um, ben, the teams you played on, they've honestly often faced serious opponents in cup competitions. You're like lower league Hectors lacing up your boots against a team of Achilles. You were part of a Newport team that drew 1-1 against Tottenham. Your Cheltenham side held Manchester City of Phil Foden, Gabriel Jesus and Riyad Mahrez. You held them off until the last 10 minutes. How do you approach games like that when everyone but the players on the pitch feel like you're outmatched before a ball's been kicked? Is there almost less pressure in those situations? Uh, I think for me as well, you have to see them on the level. You have to think they're on the same level as you are because if you think they're inferior of yourself, then you're going to possibly will or do something stupid to try and get up to their level. So, you know, even from things like um, players will often ask their players for the shirts before the games. I, that's a, like, a big no-no for me. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting you on a pedestal here. I'm playing against you. I'm going to try and beat you on this pitch. And then after the game, I'll shake your hand and possibly ask for your shirt if I feel like it. So ultimately, I have uh, missed out on a few shirts in my career that I could have got. But I feel like I've done myself and my team justice with my performances in them in them games. And it's been great to be a part of, you know, like you say, the upset in Liverpool, the leading Tottenham until the last five, ten minutes. Same with Man City. You know, they're great to be part of. And that's what it's all about. So, so yeah. Those memories. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, that's something I can tell my kids. And not many people have won at Anfield, especially not these days. I mean, back then they were winning more, more, more frequently. But nowadays, no one's <laughs> winning at Anfield, are they? So... It's something I can... Yeah. I mean, it is. The, 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 those memories, they do last longer than polyester. But I want to be clear. When, when exactly do they ask to change shirts? In the tunnel before the game? Some people do, yeah. Some people ask then. Some people ask during the game. I've even heard of captains asking captains in the pre-game meeting. Um, yeah. And whereas for me, I mean, I remember there was one, we were playing Tottenham and in the return leg, we, I'd played in both games. I started both games, played both games. And um, I came off the pitch after. I didn't have anyone's shirt because I hadn't asked for anyone's shirt until the final whistle. And then I saw one guy, I won't name his name, but he, he didn't play. He didn't play in either of the games. He had three shirts. And I was like, how does this work? How does this work? He's got three shirts and he hadn't played in the game. Like, you know, you meant to... You... Was it Rich Charleston? <laughs> <laughs> he's got a shirt instead of a goal. Yeah. He wasn't there, just for the record. And he's a good player. <laughs> oh, he is an incredible human yeah. being. But when you're at Northampton Town, you started to develop and to rely on one of what's become the signature part of your game. You can't think about Ben Tozer without this element, the long throw in that you can deliver into the box. You're like a Marvel comic hero, honestly, when I watch you do this, with the accuracy of a Scottish Schleffler approach shot. Your throw-ins, they are so bloody hard to defend that opposing teams try and put you off by moving their advertising boards closer to the pitch. I just love to be in that meeting where the, the management team are like, let's do that, let's move the advertising audience closer in, shut down Toza. They've taken away your towels, those bastards. Pep Guardiola, this is true, Pep Guardiola even stood in front of you, trying to impede you like some Catalan lamppost. What was that moment like? I mean, I'm intimidated just thinking about it. I mean, again, I, I, t- I try and take the positive from it because I see that as the ultimate respect really he's thinking he's he's up he's doing what he's got to do to win the game he's not thinking oh it's this little old Cheltenham and I'm just going to let them do what they want he's thinking no this is going to be their their biggest threat and I you know ultimately that was the one that we got the goal from but I remember Rodri who's an absolute sensational player standing in front of me um trying to get in my head as I'm taking a throw in and and you know I thought Brilliant. He's right. How's he doing that? What's he doing? What's he stood he doing? in front of us just obviously while he's warming up, like trying to like step aside me and talking to me and saying this and saying that. And it's like, yeah, I think that's the <laughs> ultimate mark of respect for me. And I don't know whether I'm taking it. Well, the before way. the game, before the game, Roger is trying to get into your head. Still, no, during the game while he's warming up, he's warming up on the sideline while I'm taking the throw from that side. But, you know, just, just things like that. I just see that as... That's brilliant. And I, that shows you how much they want to win every game as well. So I think that's another thing you can take from, from it. But going back to what you said before, Hang on. So, so Pep Guardiola is standing in front yeah. of you as you're about to take a throw in. Are you not, it's part of you not like, oh my God, yeah, that is Pep Guardiola. The I- 
<laughs> this is my opportunity yeah. to take Pep out and, and, and free the rest of the Premier League. <laughs> Make a story, yeah. Maybe Arsenal might be good after him. <laughs> you should have done it. <laughs> you should have done it. We could have all been free. You should have asked him, do you, do you want to swap shirts? I'll swap your shirt for your, your hood again. Oh, yeah. um, I, th- was it not intimidating? You were just like, this is as good as it well, gets. It, Pep yeah. Guardiola is afraid of me, Ben Tozer. But yeah, again, I see that as the ultimate mark of respect, really. It's, you know... I see it like a tennis player turning up and respecting their opposition by doing their homework and doing what they've got to do. And yeah, I mean, they were every time I had a throw and they were like, Raf is back five yards, back five yards. And of course, I'm trying to steal three or four yards again on top of that. But yeah, I just think it showed you we were under their skin and it was, it was you know, the best team in the world. And, and what a great thing to take from it. And they're afraid of Benny T. <laughs> I mean, can we go into this though? I once interviewed the great Rory Delap. Um, for those of you who don't remember him, the old Stoke defender uh, who could throw the ball 40 yards with ease. Um, you know, we talked about the origins of how he discovered his superpower. He told me his dad was a hurler. Um, um, so it was in his DNA was how he explained it. And from the age of seven months old, he was flinging golf balls around the house with velocity and zeal. By the age of 10, he could throw the ball further than any growing man. Um, in your own long through biography, Ben, when did you start to develop that skill and realise what a singular ability you had to smite all comers? I mean, mate, I've, I've always been a visual learner, but I did practice with my brother. Like, he used to play rugby and he used to do line outs. So, like, you know, throwing it like that. And um, we used to play in the garages at my grand's house and we'd throw it to each other. And I'd be throwing uphill and he'd be throwing down. He was five years older than me. And I, I was so competitive, I'd be like, right, I need to throw it the same distance. And then I would start throwing it past him. And just, <clears throat> again, visually learning from his technique and not only to him, but maybe watching like Rory Delap because he's older than me and seeing it and thinking, actually, this is something I could do. But yeah, it just, it was, we were losing a game at Northampton um, and they got quite a big area on the side of the pitch and I was playing midfield and I just ran, picked the ball up, ran and threw it and it went out the the back the other side, it got a touch and went out the other side. So I ran the other side and grabbed it. And I remember Gary Johnson saying, Hang on a sec, what's what? Why have we not been using this? And I was like, Didn't know I had it, you know. <laughs> so from then on, it's been the weapon, really. It is the weapon trademark. How do you understand what it is physically that allows you to do it? Because again, I asked Rory Delap that, and he said he'd had sports scientists study his back. And they couldn't work it out. So how do you understand it? Is it is it arm? Is it stomach? Is it shoulders? Is it wrists? Is it mind? Oh, it's purely mind. No, it's um, it's it's got to be it's got to be back and arms, long arms. I've got very long arms. I think it's got to be that a combination of technique. Completely, technique's the main thing, I think. But the back goes right back. The arms come over, and then it's just the momentum. It's yeah, it's. It's it's unique, isn't it? It is unique. One of my best things is I, I cleared the back post at Wembley. I think that's a huge pitch. And I cleared it with an absolute cannon of a throw-in. And I, I love that. I just think no one got on the end of it. I think it went out for a goal kick. That doesn't matter. Anyway. But, you know. <laughs> you didn't care. Yeah, no. You're like, everyone, look at me. When we do these races in pre-season. Everyone's doing speed <laughs> tests and stuff. And I always say the fit the sports scientists, I'm like, when we're doing throw-ins, come on, because everyone's showing me up here in the sprints. I need to, I need to get my own back. <laughs> What does it feel like that you can actually do that? Something that every player, every opposing coach, even Pep Guardiola knows is coming, but they can't stop it. Yeah, it's brilliant. They they must they must hate it. I mean, they do a lot of you you do hear in the press after games. Oh, we 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 spent an hour working on defending toes as throwing, and and you just think it's it's surreal, really. You know. They could have spent that hour on stop kicking the ball out for a throw-in. That might stop it, you know. But instead, they're spending an hour on the throw-in. Wrexham Football Club play for throw-ins. By the way, 2012-2013 season, do you know how many assists you had just from throw-ins? No, I remember A.D. Boothroyd was the manager. And I remember him, him always coming up to me every week and saying, I've got so, so-and-so now, so-and-so now. But I think I, think I had more, not necessarily directly as an assist, but there was ones where... There was touches, and I'm 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 sure it was well over fifteen. I'm, I'd say, yeah, 40, forty is well over fifteen. Yeah. 
Let's see. Let's say 16. It was 14, yeah. but bloody hell. Is there another part of your life that this superhuman Marvel comic hero skill, Ben Toda, yeah. throw in, man? That it helps? Is it like Frisbee, or are you like are you like Sylvester Stallone level over the top arm wrestling? <laughs> I mean, I'm just waiting for the call off Ryan, really, for some sort of Marvel, um, you know, rendition into into deadpool but no i'm not i'm not at all i'm absolutely not um it's uh but i don't know just throwing tennis balls uh thing i oh, just yeah you, i just better launch you know like a nerf gun uh, a nerf gun a nerf ball um you are you're a human nerf yeah, gun. yeah and that's what they should call me but yeah it's um is it a nerf that you throw on the yes. whistles oh, i yeah. used to be able to throw that a million miles but yeah nowadays i'm, I'm a bit more a bit more careful has anyone ever said this to you that you, if you were American, if you were like Ben Tozer yeah. that grew up in like Minnesota, you would have made millions as a pitcher in Major League Baseball? Yeah, or quarterback would have been a nice one. Either way, pitcher would be a bit, you bit easier pitching. on the body, Baby. isn't it? Pitcher rather than a quarterback. Uh, oh, it's yeah, hard. it's pretty. God, it'd be amazing watching you, Ben Tozer, just come in to close games. So you, I don't know what your theme song would be as you came in out the bullpen. What would it be, Ben? What would you march out to close games? 110 mile an hour fastball. Everyone knew was coming. It'd have to be something Elton John related, I think. Yeah, that's my yeah my favorite. So Elton John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might have to be something like Rocket Man. Yeah, oh, there we go. Rocket Man. You just beat me to it. Holy bloody crap! We've got it. Here he comes, Ben Tozer, the human Nerf gun. Rocket Man. God, I love this. From from your arms back to your feet. June 2015, you moved to Yeovil Town for a season before signing with South Wales Club. I'm going to mention this one quickly, Newport County. Um, This was a challenging chapter in your journey. You had a disagreement with the team's manager. You ended up having to train alone for six long months. Uh, You've talked about how you had to keep your fitness up, training on your own in a local boxing gym. Um, And you said, this is an incredible quote, you said, you felt in that moment like you never wanted to kick a ball in your life again. It was your wife, I believe, who encouraged you to start working with a counsellor and you were able to work through your challenges before rejoining the club. And Ben, you have since spoken up about this period incredibly courageously. Um, was it difficult to open up about your anxiety, um, about your decision to, to seek counsel? No, not at all, because I think, you know, I like to think talking about your weaknesses is a, is a huge strength. You know, if you put all your weaknesses out there, let everyone know your weaknesses, then in my eyes, you're a strong person. Um, because, you know, strip everything back, you know exactly what you're getting from me. That's just, you know, you know that's where you are. But um, if I believe that if you can help someone, and there are people, you know, sadly, one of my friends killed himself at the end of last season. Um, and that was pure, through pure mental mental health. His, his mental health wasn't good. I've got one of, my, one of my real good mates now at the moment really struggling. I speak to him quite a lot. Um, but I just believe that being there for them, understanding um, what they are going through, not what they're entirely going through, because everything's different. I completely appreciate that. But just having that sort of empathy and understanding what what it's like. And, and I feel like me talking about it helps helps people to think, crikey, if you're in that situation and you're going through it, now I'm not saying I'm, you know, anything, but people do see footballers as, as something. So, you know, we're just human beings at the end of the day. But I think if you're if you're if you're letting everyone know that you can be like this, then it's it's understandable for them to be like this as well. They're not alone, basically. So I just think if you can help people and help people understand um that it's that it's kind of normal to suffer with anxiety and, and things, you know, people everyone everyone had a first day at school, right? How anxious how anxious were you when you went into the classroom on your first ever day at school? That's anxiety. Everyone has that. So, you know, just got to own it a little bit and understand that people have it and, and, and have to deal with it. God bless. I mean, it is the most important thing. We always say um, to be able to articulate that anxiety, to be able to uh, get that fear out, to be able to talk about it is half the challenge to to solving it. Hearing you talk about that, you're right, as a footballer, is is really inspirational. And you pivoted from that moment and have soared since. You left Newport County, you moved to Cheltenham, you captained the side 
two-time player of the year, helped another team nickname the Robins. Ben Toza, he loves his Robins, um, up to League One for the first time since the 2009 season. League One, those two words, Wrexham's current promised land. And you've been there, Ben Toza. You know, in your experience, in real terms, what's the most important single quality a team needs to achieve promotion from League Two to League One? I think you need togetherness is absolutely paramount. If you've got a team and a group and uh, a group of staff as well, working together and all in, heading in the same direction, trusting the kind of process, you're all on the same page. You are the majority of the way there. Um, you know, morale, momentum, they're all huge parts that, that come into it after. But the togetherness initially is is everything, really. Togetherness is a theme I think we'll come back to in a moment. But August 2021, a life-changing month. You played two games with Cheltenham Town in League One and then signed for the mighty, mighty Wrexham. Ben, this moment, you'd spent a decade with clubs that were constantly fighting for motion out of League Two with players who would have bitten one of your long throw arms off to be in your position. You know, you're there. You're in League One. What made you decide to drop down two levels to join Rex? And what made this club, this dream, so appealing to you? Well, I mean, there's there's always... I was at the, the age... Was I 31 at the time? There's You've got to think about your family first and foremost. That's That's the first thing that would have probably come into it a bit more security I've had two young kids and and I can't I can't hide and deny that fact but um I was I had a lot of doubts about whether to go and stuff and my wife said to me she was like look at what you've achieved at Cheltenham player of the year two years in a row you've just captained the team to promotion why not go and do that again like because let's be honest Cheltenham are at not the ceiling of where they can go but they're they're very very close to it and can you realistically go and do that again with Cheltenham and I was like yeah we can go and do something this year at Cheltenham I believe it I believe it off the back of promotion you know positive and momentum and all that stuff but then you know when I spoke to the gaffer um he just kind of yeah sold it to me and and the project and everything that was kind of Phil Parkinson yeah and and he just sold everything to you you know it was kind of um as soon as I spoke to him I thought yeah that's it I need to I need to go I need to go and I need to go and try and do that and emulate them things and and be part of something really exciting I mean I I wasn't naive and I I knew what was going on at Wrexham but at the same time when you're looking from the outside you're kind of thinking right is that a bit of a gimmick um and then from from the first couple weeks you kind of realize no it's not they're serious they're they're, they're going about the business right and it's just exciting It's, it's such an exciting place to be and it's an exciting thing to at the end of my career twilight of my career whatever you want to call it it's um it's amazing to be a part of. It's one of them things you wish you were younger, but you're not. So just go and enjoy it while while you're there. By the way, Phil Parkinson, when he's doing normal talking to players like you, courting and wooing you, does he f and blind just in everyday conversation? <laughs> no, he doesn't. No. no, he doesn't. No, it's quite funny to see on the documentary. Actually, every second word is, is fuck, isn't it? <laughs> know, I think like, okay, uh, fucking I, fucking like you know follow up. Yeah, up. I know adjective adverb. Conjunction yeah. uses the F word for. <laughs> I'm amazed he can actually speak in strung sentences without it. It's beautiful. Yeah. You were privy to that. And whatever he said, we fucking need you here. Fucking Ben, fucking, fucking toes are fucking. Get your fucking self here. Um, it worked because, and not just for you, you were one of 14 players who joined the club that season. This was nine months after the Ryan and Rob takeover, including Super Paul Mullin. A meaty striker, Ollie Palmer, defender Aaron Hayden. Uh, you mentioned Phil Parkinson. He he was also a relative newcomer to North Wales um, when he spoke to you. you know, this is a team um, not only facing a then 14th straight year in the National League where they so desperately wanted to emerge from, um, but there was a tremendous challenge in that half the squad had to introduce themselves to the other half. I mean, I imagine a dressing room where there were just hello, my name is badges all over the place. Take us back there. Because you've already mentioned togetherness as that key attribute. What was it like? How did you manage to build and strengthen those relationships so bloody quickly and turn those individuals into a collective? I mean, first and foremost, full credit to the gaffer for his recruitment, for recruiting the right personality. Absolutely, that's that's key. You know, you, you've got to recruit the right people and the right personalities. But I'll tell you what, the one thing that really helps 
gel a team together is when you win games. That's that's massive. You know, everyone's on the same page. Everyone wants to be at the club and you start winning games. But in the dressing room, I, I, I strongly believe um, setting standards, everyone being on the same page, i.e. fines, things like that. You've got to set a standard so that no one, everyone like toes the line. No one's off here doing their own thing and thinking they're this and whatever. Everyone's on the same page and you've got that respect then of each other. And me, as the one who kind of has to um, enforce it as, as such, as and I'm doing it as well, and I'm, I'm leading by example in that, then people kind of, as, as club captain. People kind of then naturally, they, they go, oh, I mean, if, if Toes is doing it or Youngie's doing it or anyway, so-and-so is, is doing it, then, you know, we better adhere to it as well because they're not, they're not cutting corners in, in that regard. So I think that's, that's one of the big things in, in the respect and, and also, when you say toe in the, when I say toe in the line, is teaching people, telling people what's right and what's wrong. Every, I know, I believe I know what's right and what's wrong in a football environment. If someone's doing something that's, you know, someone's being a bit of a knob or whatever, just tell them, you know. <laughs> or if someone has been in the club shop and picked up a shirt and then paid for it yet, and the club pay, well, just say, look, go go and fucking pay for your shirt or pay for your tickets or get, you know, just so because we can become some people. Just because you're a footballer doesn't mean you could become a knobhead and and you know feel like you're entitled and and you deserve everything and, and you know you're a normal human being at the end of the day you have to you know respect and adhere to things so I just think keeping everyone on the same on the same page is it, it, it you know you all move forward together you all go back together so yeah God just because you're a footballer does not mean you can be a knobhead and sadly I'm living proof that just because you're a knobhead doesn't mean you can actually become a footballer <laughs> if only that was true Ben Sousa by the way very quick one you're winning on the field are you still winning on the pool table at Rex? we haven't got one but I think if I was I'd be there I'd be up there I'd be up there I fancy you would be up there who else would be up there oh um, I wouldn't want to play Mullin I would not want to play Mullin no. um, uh, pool Mullin yeah pool 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 Mullin I love it yeah pool Great Mullin um, it's uh we, we played in, we played in America actually pre season so uh, we you were did. playing doubles and Oli Palmer fancied himself I can't remember who he was paired with and he was giving it you know I can't Oli Palmer I can only imagine he does every shot behind the back it's just because <laughs> with 1864 along his chest yeah um, <laughs> but yeah he was he was giving it the big one walking around as you do and I was like right um, I think it was with Rob Layton I was like Rob fancy it let's play him. We beat him, knocked him off the table. And then it was the same with table tennis. He was giving it the big one in LA. Table tennis is table tennis. That. We went to San Diego. We had a table tennis there. And he didn't win a game. He just didn't win a game. And he was finding every excuse under the sun. It was brilliant. It was it was great great to have that moment to just put him back in his place, really. God bless you. And Ollie Palmer, we'll be getting you on another episode of this show and diving I'll deep you into what, that. You'll, you'll, have, an excuse, you have, you'll been... have an excuse for losing. Oh, it was yeah. too dark. Yes, oh, rotated cuff, rotated cuff. Yeah, problem. I'll take all but the excuses you, you, out, of, you, out, of his, out of his hands right now, all right? He lost fair and square. We swapped <laughs> bats. It wasn't dark. It was the same light for me, you know. <laughs> you swapped bats? Yeah, we swapped bats. I think, I think I'm being three or four. Only farmer's that person. You've got the good yeah, bat. Literally. All right, take it, Paul. Yeah. So get him on. And, it, 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 you know, he'll vouch for it. I'm sure he'll be, be the honourable thing and vouch for it. <laughs> I love you, grown men. So validating yeah. that you're still swapping yeah. bats like you were yeah, kids. Yeah. I love that. But you, you, you were being club captain at Wrexham, just as you were at Cheltenham Town. What kind of leader do you try and be? What What is the most important secret of of, of Ben Toza leadership? I think, like I said, touching on it before, um, setting standards, setting standards, doing the right thing day in day out, and and knowing what's right and what's wrong, and also trying to help others in any way on the pitch, off the pitch. Um, on the pitch, it's, you know, I've played a lot of games. I don't claim to know everything, but I've been in a lot of situations where I feel like I can help and guide through, guide other people through them. Um, whether that's someone next to me or someone in front of me, position and wise, just tweaking little things in the game, a little bit of game management. Um, yeah, so, so, so things like that, really. And like I said, off the pitch, what I was touching on before, really driving standards, doing the right things day in, day out, and 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 yeah, just trying to do the right things. Your first season with Wrexham, the first season of the documentary, 
came down to a playoff semi-final against Grimsby Town. Real back and forth humdinger that had more lead changes than OpenAI headquarters last weekend. And every time Wrexham scored, Grimsby answered. They finished an exclamation point of an afternoon with a 119th minute heartbreaking goal. 1-5-4, moved on to the final. Wrexham back into the off-season, knowing it would be another year in the National League. What was your mood like? Can you take us to that night? How dark does it feel? How long does that pain last, knowing that you and the rest of that squad have got to regroup? You're back at square one again, that same square where you'd started for so many bloody seasons. That was uh, It was very dark, actually. I felt after that Grimsby game, it was, it was horrendous. Um, I remember I got in and... and you know, the gaffer said a few things, but at this point, you just you, you're not listening. It's 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 awful, but you're not. You're just kind of reliving what's just gone on. And and I remember I was sat in the sh- I was literally sat down in the shower, like just didn't want any any didn't want to see anyone, didn't want to speak to anyone. And I remember the the owners had kind of come into the dressing room and I, and they were like, "Our oh, toes, um, Rob and Ryan are in." And I was like, oh, so, "Sorry, but I don't I don't right now. I don't give a shit." Like you know, it sounds awful. But I'm I'm just like dealing with this in my own way, and I kind of snuck out the stadium and didn't want to like see fans and and things like that. And and I just remember getting back to my car and my little boy. He was like, "Don't worry, daddy. Like you know, give me a cuddle." Like and I was like, "Bloody hell, he's right." Like you know, he's he's at this time. I think he was three, maybe four. Don't worry, daddy, and give me a cuddle. And I'm thinking, nah, that's just brought me straight back down to earth. You know, really, is it the be all and end all? No. It's it's not, but it still hurts. So I kind of took myself out that night on my, on my own, went out for a few drinks, and and um, yeah, it just kind of cleared my head. And it took it took about three or four days, and and it it really yeah, you go into a bit of a dark place actually. It, it, I mean, taking it on myself, it's 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 tough. I, I I felt a lot of responsibility with it, um, but then you have to kind of check yourself and 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 think right now, got to do what's right now to kind of build and go again you know I'm gonna let out a little bit of steam and then I'm gonna build and go again and we're gonna go and do this so yeah don't worry daddy those three words that that is life and everything that that is important and we all know this spoiler alert if you've not seen season two of the documentary Wrexham rebounded finally earned that long dreamt of long awaited promotion um, in the documentary, one episode at a time. Um, there were actually surprising off the off the field moments in the series. There was an early season exchange between you and Paul Mullin at half time. As you questioned his decision not to pass to a teammate after you, you'd fallen behind against Frenemies Notts County, and I was watching that and I was wondering: Does having cameras following you all the time does it affect how you react to certain situations? Do, do you ever find yourself in your own mind? you know, checking yourself, wondering whether you should or shouldn't say something or, or do you just forget um, and just forget that this is going to end up on screen? Well, in that moment, I can tell you now, if I knew the camera was there, I would never have said it. I would never have said it. It's, it's one of them where I've come in at half time on a lot of occasions and you see the camera there and you think, oh, can I, I, I need to get a laugh my chest here, but I can't because the camera's there and you don't want it to be like you're doing it for the cameras. It needs to be authentic. But in that moment, like I say, the the camera, I didn't know I didn't know it was there. So it was um I suppose it's nice to see them them real moments, which you, you don't capture very often because of the camera's being there. Uh but at the same time, you know, we, we are pretty we're an honest group of players, so you don't very often have to question each other. You know that if someone's made a mistake, everyone makes mistakes. You know, just get on with it and uh we, we know that we're an honest group. You've got to get yourself final edit in your next contract, Ben Toza. Just final sign off. The Ben Toza cut of the documentary would be, oh, that would be a thing to see. But the most incredible part of the series to me, honestly, is how it shows the humanity of of the players, the individuals, uh, the longtime supporters, uh, really of the city of Wrexham itself. And over the past two seasons, Paul Mullins spoken at length, uh, came on this show, talked about his son, Albie's autism diagnosis, uh, Wrexham local Sean Winters opened up about being a single dad, um, you know, grappling with the decision um, that, to stop drinking. Former Wrexham captain Neil Roberts talked about how he struggled after the team was relegated to the National League. And, and the most heart wrenching of all was was watching you, Ben, your dad Keith, 
uh, at the Stoke Kairas for the final home match of the season. Uh, there to watch you lift the trophy uh, as champions of the National League. And just two months later, he lost his own fight with leukemia, um, which is which is such a profound loss. But but you've used your father's story to encourage other men to seek treatment if they start to notice changes in their own health. And again, I'm fascinated. What gave you the strength to speak up, to be so open uh, about what your family has gone I through? I think I just you just like to think I could try and turn a negative into a positive. It's, um, you know, the situation about my dad, it's it's hard. It's, it's hard to talk about it right now. You know, it's, it's, it's one of them things where you don't ever envisage it happening and because it happened so quick and it was such a shock. It was like, fuck, you know, it was, um, yeah. But like I said, after it happened and like when, when my dad told me that he had leukemia and he was in hospital, um, sadly died two days later. Um, but, I just remember being on the phone to him and being like, dad, just pay, stay positive. You're in the right place now. And, you know, thinking, right, I've got to stay positive for him. So just trying to have that positive side of things, even though I put the phone down to him and fuck it and broke down straight away. But for him to see it and to, to feel it, ultimately it didn't help. It didn't, it didn't help at all. But, you know, just to, when you go through something, like I say, try and turn that negative into a positive and if it can help people and I've had lots of people come up to me and, and say thankfully um, I've watched your interview on BBC and you know it made me go and get checked um, I would never have done it I wanted to do it because I, I don't want to see my boy in the same situation you're in and it's like fucking hell it's powerful but I'm grateful that hopefully it has helped people along the way and that's 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 all you can do really because what's gone is gone sadly but if you can help other people in other situations, then then, then why not? Ben, you are a, a, a beautiful, quite a philosophical um, human being, and I've loved talking to you. But last question, Wrexham's longtime announcer, Mark Griffiths, the mighty Mark Griffiths, started uh, last season off, that glorious season, by saying that every other year he'd watch the club. He'd always had a, quote, feeling somewhere between hope and fear. But now... He actually felt expectation, which as an Everton fan, I don't really know what he's talking about, but it sounds it sounds beautiful. Do, do you feel those expectations as you move towards the halfway point of this season? What are your expectations for Wrexham? Are they the same uh, as what they were during week one when you were running onto the field to face Milton Keynes? Yeah, I think the expectation of the club is, you know, they want to keep moving forwards. And that's that's ultimately what we want to do. And and whether that's, um, you know, a year from now, five years from now, they've got a long-term a long term project. And this is also a stepping stone. So for us, our expectation upon ourselves is promotion. That is that is honestly our expectation. Um, we want to continue to grow as a team, as a family, as a club. Um, of course, there's certain things outside of what we can do that outside our jurisdiction that can do that. But... If we can continue to build that that whole momentum as a as a team and as a club and as a family, then you know the expectations, the the sky's the limit. Really, the, the club can can go wherever it wants to be and 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 do what it wants to do. You you've been on teams that have made this jump, Ben, from League Two to League One. You, you've been in a locker room, you've been in a dressing room that 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 knows where it's going. Does it feel that this season, this you know what you dream of, what you expect, will come true? Um, again, it's 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 hard because you don't me myself. I don't like to look too far ahead. I really don't. It's it's one of them things where you kind of um, you're in survival mode. It's a game at a time. You need to take it a game at a time. And 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 I know it's a cliche and everyone says it, but you you have to. You can't start looking at the games around Christmas. You can't start looking at games after Christmas. Or oh, we've played so and so last game of the season, or or whatever. What's the point? Because that might be worth nothing if you don't take care of what's in front of you right now. So that's ultimately what we have to do. We have to we have to make sure we build and build and build and build, and hopefully, come the end of the season, we are where we want to be. And that's, you know, we we'll, we know that we'll be we'll be fighting and, and and trying to do everything we can to do that because we've got the lads that we have and the, and the staff that we have. So that's yeah, that's that's it really. God speed to you, Ben Tozer, uh, to game by game, um, to you, to your family. Uh, especially to your son, 
Uh, don't worry, Daddy, I will not forget that. To your club uh, and your city, courage. Brilliant.